really good to meet you all. I'm going to start now. My name is James Honeybourne and I'm a wildlife filmmaker. Um, and um, if you were to know me, it might be from my last series, Blue Planet 2, which um, I was part of a big team that um, made the series out of Bristol. And um, it was for us, you know, a, a five year effort and a huge labor of love. Um, spurred by our um, fascination, really, and uh, love of the ocean. Uh, I should just make it clear at the beginning that I don't work for the BBC anymore, and I've now set up my own company, Freeborn Media. So today I'm, I'm speaking as an individual and uh, really as an ocean advocate. Um, please find Louise Plantin as she is illustrating this workshop live. You can check her out in the gallery uh, and do pin her if you'd like, um, as there will be some amazing uh, artwork appearing uh, as we talk. Uh, I'm going to have a chat for about 15 minutes uh, and then try and answer uh, some questions. So please do pop them in the chat if you have any. Um, thank you very much for being here. So the, uh, the ocean's always been a big part of my life. Um, my grandparents lived by the sea and I was lucky enough from you know, my earliest memories sort of rock pooling uh, in the waters of the English Channel. And uh, it's wonderful to be part of C7 and to meet so many of you passionate ocean activists. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, many of my more recent storytelling experiences have come from making Blue Planet too. So firstly, I'd like to pay tribute to the many scientists, NGOs, and maybe even people in this room um, who have been talking about and taking action on marine conservation, climate change. Then. Pollution, biodiversity loss. Sorry, we've got some noise coming in here. I think it's gone now. Um, let me just say that again. Um, I just want to pay tribute really to all the people who've been talking about and taking action on marine conservation, climate change, pollution, biodiversity loss, and many of the other issues of ocean health since long before Blue Planet 2. And you know better than anyone the challenges we all face. You might think that creating and shaping stories about the ocean isn't quite as exciting or effective as taking direct action. So today, I thought we'd just take a few minutes to talk about the power and the purpose of storytelling. I see my job as a storyteller is to work with filmmakers and scientists and institutions to help better communicate issues surrounding science, nature, and the health of the environment. And I aim to do this in ways that connect with as many people as possible on an emotional level to, to really help engage us, to make us laugh and, and, and even to cry because there is little more powerful than a good story well told. I believe stories have the power to move people at the deepest levels. Stories can propel ideas into this world. They catalyze the conversations we all need to have. They get things started. Stories can help us get things done. And if we can just reach enough people, we might just be able to tweak that dial and help more people connect more passionately with the ocean. And if we do our job well enough, then the real heroes become our audiences, everyday people all around the world who become moved enough emotionally to respond to our stories and to take meaningful actions themselves. That, for us, became something that the press called the Blue Planet Effect. And um, Lucy, could you share the screen, please? Um, you might remember some of the headlines um, from, from the series at the time. We have a screen which is just about to come up. And um, that's it. You can remember the, the, sort of the chat maybe that was going on around it at the time. And, and uh, we've heard an awful lot about plastics now, but, but back then um, it was something that really was um, not on everyone's radar. Um, but here's a little known fact. Across the whole TV series, and that was seven hours of television, there was just 14 minutes of airtime given over to plastic and chemical pollution. We actually spent more airtime highlighting potentially greater global issues like the effects of climate change and warming seas, but we didn't get the same response. So let's be very clear, our job is not done yet. 
that there was something about the tangibility of plastic pollution that viewers seized onto. And what happened next was thrilling. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is an image of the online activity around ocean issues. So the, the, the conversation that was happening at around the time we released um, Blue Planet 2. You can see um, surfers against sewage there and um, a lot of people talking. This was, um, I think, UK focused. Um, but you can see um, the conversations were already very much live in, in, in this space with the NGOs. But if we go to the next graph, This is a chart that shows us what happened when the TV show aired. And um, what you can see, I think, is that the conversation that many people were having was amplified by the series. Uh, that was perhaps what was the Blue Planet effect, but the truth is we couldn't have done it alone. Thanks, Lucy, you can stop sharing that. So I'm often asked, how, how did we get there? How did we get to that point? How did that all happen? Um, well, it started five years before, back in 2013. And um, well, I have to say, not everyone thought it was a particularly great idea to do seven hours of TV on fish. Um, it did feel quite daunting, but um, we had built a really core cool team of ocean, ocean passionate storytellers. And um, our aim, our ambition, we, what we knew we had to do was to reach sophisticated, modern audiences. So our approach was entertainment first to seek to create a level of emotional engagement beyond what might be the normal sort of documentary response of awe and wonder, and rather to create an experience that would resonate and be as captivating to watch as any TV drama. But how would we do this when the audience's main experience of sea life was at the supermarket or on the plate? To most of us, life beneath the waves is both out of sight and out of mind. Marine creatures lurk in seas that are far off, cold, dark, alien, unforgiving, even scary. The underwater realm is not a place that has much relevance in most of our daily lives. Somehow we would need our audiences to fall in love with this remote world so they would come to have empathy to really connect and care for it. We knew that. So one of our ambitions was to tell as many new stories as possible because we humans are hardwired to respond emotionally to surprise and novelty. It makes us feel good, literally. So compelling new discoveries have the power to draw an audience in and then we can blow their minds in astonishment. If you just think in the first episode of Blue Planet, the, the giant trevallies that, that leapt out of the sea and caught turns in midair. We, we as filmmakers, we, we, we heard that from one source in Southern Africa who said they thought they'd glimpsed it. You know, it's, it wasn't recorded. It wasn't known. It wasn't, it, we, 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 took, we mounted an expedition on faith with that uh, and we were very lucky to get it. But equally think of the little tusk fish. We really wanted the audiences to look at a fish in the eyes and see how clever it was. And there was a little guy on a coral reef using tools. Um, those sorts of things, when we haven't seen them before, they, they give us a hugely rewarding sense of experience. So, so th that to me is part of what our storytelling has to do. It has to tell new stories. It has to find novelty and surprise. Uh, and in those early years for us, our abilities to collaborate with scientists around the world to research new stories became our most important skill set. All the while we we're making the series, we had a building sense of urgency because we could see firsthand how the ocean's health was deteriorating. You don't have to spend long in the company of marine scientists to get the feeling our planet's life support system is in trouble. The whole ocean system is under great strain and it's changing fast, most often for the worst. But how could we broach that subject matter and keep the majority of viewers with us? Some early decisions helped us along the way. Before we even started filming, we decided not to shy away from the major issues like warming seas and coral bleaching. What we said to our crews was, go and tell it like it is. We deliberately chose not to frame up plastic pollution or discarded fishing gear that we encountered. Instead, we 
decided we'd film it beautifully, which would help us tell a story that would move viewers, perhaps with a different range of emotions. And 125 expeditions later, we've been to 39 countries, we'd worked across every ocean, we spent 6,000 hours underwater, and a thousand more in submarines. The series was simulcast in the UK and in China, where it reached over 225 million viewers in just the first six weeks. And over the next six months, it was broadcast around the world. But that wasn't all. Through our companion digital impact campaign, hashtag our Blue Planet, we were able to respond in real time to audiences. We were able to tell more stories about plastics and other marine issues through social media and to give people the tools to find out more information, to give them solutions about the changes that they could make with their own everyday lives. So looking back on it now, it makes me realize that Blue Planet 2 showed that people care deeply about the health of the ocean. When people are invited in, they feel a real sense of responsibility to look after our world. The stories we tell and how people hear them matter. Blue Planet 2 showed what's possible. Now we've got much more to do. Excuse me a sec. So how do we create positive change? As David Attenborough says, saving the planet is now a communications challenge, not a science, scientific one. We know the science. Since the dawn of time, storytelling has been the best communication tool we have. There are still many stories to be told that can influence positive change. And let's never underestimate the power of storytelling to share new ideas and invoke meaningful change. They can help propel us to the actions needed to heal our ocean and to heal our climate. After the series aired, I was invited to Westminster to explain why the Blue Planet of, uh, to explain the Blue Planet effect. And I told the department concerned that we succeeded by not trying too hard. And what I really meant was we didn't take the most direct approach and berate our audience. How we communicate matters as much as whether we communicate. I, I believe that no one could sit for hours on end in the comfort of their living room and being told a long list of what's wrong in the world. It's not a question of bombarding people with more stories of loss and peril. That's most likely to leave viewers feeling powerless. If we lecture us, we, we switch off. Confound us with problems, we will feel overwhelmed. So, you know, we never asked people to stop using single-use plastic or to go and clean a beach. Rather, than pushing out alarming facts, we drew people in through the power of emotional storytelling, which is why the real heroes are not the storytellers, but the viewers. Those who react to what they've seen and heard and decide to write themselves a better ending. And with Blue Planet, people wanted to find out ways to make real and measurable impacts, to clean beaches, to ban single-use plastics, to take on systemic problems like food packaging, waste disposal, and recycling. What I've learned is that we must be brave enough not to lecture or preach and not to tell people what to do. Rather, let's make our storytelling entertaining, ambitious, emotionally engaging enough so that it stirs our hearts and challenges our minds. People care, we can change. We need to show the possibilities as well as the problems. And then have the faith in the human response, in our natural desire to change things for the better, that we can and will write ourselves that better ending, the one we all want. Excuse me. Back in a sec. Right. Um, so what advice can I give to aspiring storytellers? Where should you start? Well, there are obvious practical considerations. You know, what digital platform do you use? Will it be written? Are you going to convey it through pictures? There are endless ways to captivate and engage and get your story across. Beyond that, one piece of advice would be to really tap in to your emotions and to have a very clear idea of the emotional response that you want from others. As individuals, when faced with overwhelming environmental issues, we can feel powerless. Whereas a story that feels personal and relatable 
and achievable and empowering is likely to inspire us to action. Whether we're feeling motivated to do nothing or to act on the issue depends on how we are feeling. So as you can see, our feelings are really important, a really important consideration in how we inspire and empower people to make meaningful change. So what of the future? What's next for this conversation, for, 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 for the debate around ocean health? For storytelling. For me, the future of storytelling in this space is all about moving people towards action, not leaving them in despair. There's some great research looking at how the ocean and the climate is framed and how we can make sure we don't just move people, we move them towards action. For instance, people tend to think the ocean is beautiful, but it's over there. We need to move people towards recognizing the ocean is part of us and that we all need a healthy ocean to be healthy ourselves. Are we telling people that everything's ruined, that it's beyond repair, that there's no hope? Or are we helping people to see that we have harmed the ocean, but together we can heal it? Lots of ocean stories focus on the problem humans are creating, and yes, we need to hear those. But are we leaving people thinking that humans are the problem and the system is broken? If that's the end of the story, then I think we've lost. It's about helping people to feel a sense of urgency, but also crucially, a sense of possibility. It's about, it's about showing and tapping into an overwhelming public appetite for action, for change and leadership, so that ultimately, ultimately, we heal, not harm our ocean. If you'd like to um, continue this conversation in the coming weeks, We'll be discussing it on our hashtag see our future uh, and uh, i'm gonna um, have a look and see if there's any questions coming on the chat now so thank you very much for your time and i hope um that, that might be helpful in um some of the things you're planning to do so let's have a look thanks for the questions coming in give me a second Um, I just wanted just to I just want to take on board the, the the question around um how do you make a compelling story create lasting change um not just for a few moments after um th that because in such a busy world that is always a challenge and we all know that a you know any new story can be a big one day forgotten the next so um, that is the great challenge of storytellers, but it's also the great opportunity for storytellers because there are always new stories to be told and there's always new ways of telling an important story. So uh, in my opinion, um, it's about keeping the conversation going. We, we, the phrase I, I use all the time um, is let's catalyze the conversation. Let's get a conversation going in the space. And it's then about keeping that conversation going. And there's many ways to keep a conversation going, as you all know. So, so th think of it like a conversation, and and keep keep it going. Um, is there a place for humour in this? Um, I, I really believe there is, because um, as I say, it's entertainment first, and um, we have to reach as many people as we can. So we want to entertain, and entertainment um, in tele television terms means. Um, um, really, it's about um, getting as many or oh, full of range of emotional responses as you can. And humour can be a great tool in that. Um, you know, and there's, there's often wonderfully amusing things that animals do, for example, um, that can show us a, a, a problem. It's, it, can it work for a serious issue? I don't, I don't see why not. I, I, I think it's, you know, I'm sure there's been, I'm sure, I don't know, I can't think off the top of my head, but I'm sure there's been some sort of great comedy done around um, some of these very serious issues because it's a, it's a good way of engaging people. Um, do you start with a narrative in mind or go looking for the footage? Yes, um, we, we, we sort of do both. 
we have a twin strategy on that. Um, it's really important to have a plan um, and you can't just go out and start filming stuff hoping something's going to come along. So we do, we do actually plan in a lot of detail what we hope a compelling narrative would be um, for a film on whatever subject we're making, whether it's a film about coral reefs or whether it's a film about a place. Um, you know, you, you want to create a shape for that narrative. Um, but equally, um, I think we all know that uh, the wildlife doesn't read the scripts we write, but it often writes the best scripts. And so by being there and just by um, having camera crews in the right place at the right time, quite often magic happens and we see things that we haven't really seen before. And we have had the opportunity to make new scientific discoveries in some of these films, which is also um, you know, hugely rewarding when we can give a bit of payback to all the amazing scientists who helped tell us about these stories in the first place. Um, so uh, that feels um, an important thing to do. And there's always that synergy. So in the answer to the question around, um, do we film first or craft the narrative? It's you craft a bit of narrative, you go out and film and then you recraft the narrative depending on what you've got. Um, what, what other stories need to be told? Um, there's countless stories. I mean, th this, I think this is the point really. It's about, there are as many stories as there are imagination and the more people we have involved in the conversation, the more stories there will be to be told. So let's just get people involved in the conversation. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's any themes coming up in this, in this chat. I'm missing. What's the biggest consideration to engage rather than preach? The main issues in the stories. How do you convey that? Um, I, I don't think we. I don't think we want to preach. I don't think it's the most effective way. But if we tell stories around the subject and we introduce it in novel and surprising ways, then I think people will will engage with it and be entertained by it. And then, and then we can start to, to think about it. And you know, for, for every story has a beginning, a middle and end. And quite often, how we come into a story, how we sell it is very different from the take home, how you feel about it at the end when you see the bigger picture. And um, these are all devices that storytellers use. What I would like to say, though, is that pretty much every phone nowadays has got a camera in it. You can get out there and you can make videos and you can post them on social media. And it can be that straightforward and that simple. And you, you are a storyteller too. Um, there's no great barrier to starting this. And I think it's really important that people feel empowered and able to be part of that conversation. And I think social media, by the way, this is another question here about how do you get your stories distributed and noticed? I, I think, you know, th these digital platforms are wonderful and they're out there. And then it's down to you and the power of your storytelling. And if you think about what I said earlier about trying to engage people on an emotional level, if you start to move people, they'll start to share your stories. Um, I, I think um, a lot of people ask, how would you, you know, how can we get involved in the industry? Um, it, it's just get in touch, get in touch. The, the industry is huge and it, it's thriving. Um, and there's many, many um, ways of getting involved both in television, um, but also you know, within the digital space. And, 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 and if you can come to a conversation having made some videos and shown what you can do, then um, you know, you're, you're really already on the track and, and you also, you're coming with a bit of a portfolio. So I'd say get out there and um, get filming. I think I'm going to have to leave it there because I'm, I'm, I, I know that this was, this was the end of our time slot. Um, but I'm really grateful for everyone who's, who's uh, reached out and gone involved. And for all the questions that we haven't answered, I'm very sorry. I will try and take note of them and um, keep this conversation alive. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much indeed for all your time. Um, and I think I have to hand it back to the supervisor. So I, I, I'm going to say thank you and uh, have a really great evening. Goodbye. <laughs>